All right, I told you we we're going to start here. We read from Revelation chapter 21, and there's a couple verses in Revelation that I want to point out. But before we do that, flip back, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 6. I had you keep a bookmarker there. And keep a bookmarker there, too, when we go back to Revelation 21, because the next place we're going to go after Revelation, we're going to go right back to Proverbs again. But Proverbs 6, verse number 16. Now, we're continuing on a series I started a couple weeks ago. Verse number 16, the Bible says, These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Now, the, the title of my story is Six Things God Hates. And I did a proud look last time. So this week we're looking at the next one, a lying tongue. But what's in, real interesting about this next one that we're doing, a lying tongue, is you notice in verse 16 it says, These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination. He lists off then seven things, but look at what's listed in there twice. Verse number 17 says, A proud look, a lying tongue. And then verse number 19, a false witness that speaketh lies. Lying is mentioned there twice. That's why he says there's six things the Lord hates and seven are an abomination. Seven are an abomination because he lists lying twice. This, of, of all the ones that we're going to look at in this list, probably should get the most emphasis and, and really the most diligence in looking to why is it so important that God mentions this twice? Well, I think one of the reasons is because it's probably the easiest thing for us to do. Telling lies, telling deceits, not telling the truth is something that is very simple for us to do. But we are going to look at this. We're going to look at a lot of scriptures involved with, with lying and being untruthful and being not honest. And we're going to look at some applications and in areas that maybe you don't even realize you are lying in. Because we want to make sure that, you know, hey, if God hates this, this is an abomination to God. Let's not do it. <laughs> you know, if God hates something and he says it's abominable, let's not make God angry. There's no reason to get God on our bad side. You know, let's be good children. So let's look at this a little bit further. The reason why we start off there in Revelation 21, look at verse number 8, of course, lying just to, just to demonstrate how serious of a sin lying is. Revelation 21 verse 8 says, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That second death, that eternal torture and torment in hell and that lake of fire, the burning and flaming, says all liars have their part there. He lists the sin of telling a lie with taking somebody's life with murder. He lists it with the idolaters and the sorcerers and these really wicked people, these whoremongers. He says all liars. Now look, I know that we've all told lies in our life before. Every single one. We're not, we're not clear of, of you know, having never done this in our lives. Which is why I always show this verse to people out soul winning because I know that everyone's told lies before. But what happens is we live in a day, especially today, where... People's word doesn't really matter that much anymore. Lying has just become accepted in many areas of our lives. In dealing with certain types of people, you just expect lies. And it's become not that big of a deal. And even when you talk to people, say, yeah, well, yeah, of course I've lied. You know, and, and it's just like, it's not a big deal. But I'm not a bad person. Well, according to the Bible, you deserve hell just based on that lie. And people like to try to twist it and say, oh, well, no, that's just referring to really bad liars or whatever. Look at um, verse number 27 of the same chapter, chapter 21. It says, And there shall in no wise enter into it, talking about heaven, into the kingdom of God. There shall no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie. You say, yeah, but I'm not a habitual liar. It's not like I just always lie. I mean, I said, if you've made one lie, it says nothing, you know, you're not entering into the kingdom of God just from making one lie. Now you say, well, wait a minute, how is that possible? You know, how is anyone going to make it to heaven? Because we've all made a lie. Well, we're cleansed through the blood of Jesus Christ. The, the, the sin of, of making a lie is atoned for. And actually, when you're born again, that's a new spirit. There's a new creature, literally, that's born inside of you that cannot sin. 
Now, we still reside in the sinful flesh, which is why we still do sin. But the spirit is not that what sins. And when, we, when the body passes away, we're left with that soul and spirit. And that spirit has never commit sin. That's in, in read First John. When you start reading First John, chapter, especially like chapter 3, you're going to read some, some passages that might be a little confusing and say, well, wait a minute. It says, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. How can that be? If, I mean, we're all still sinners. It's because whatsoever is born of God is the new spirit. And that is the seed, the uncorruptible seed from the word of God. It's perfect. And the new creature is perfect, but we are not. And that's why we're admonished over and over again, walk in the spirit so you don't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. The dichotomy is the sinful flesh versus the righteous spirit. The spirit that's born into God's family, that's cleansed, that's born again. And that's why, of course, obviously, even if you've made a lie, your spirit is going to make it to heaven and God's going to give you a new body. But for anyone who doesn't have that new creature, of course they're not going to make it into heaven. But this is, you know, I, I kind of want to just clarify that a little bit. It's some people get confused with, with, with some of these passages. But the reason why I'm even bringing this up is because even making one lie is very, very bad. It's very important to God. It's, it's something that He takes seriously. It's actually one of the Ten Commandments, right? The Bible says, Neither shalt thou bear false witness against thy neighbor. Bearing a false witness means you are saying you're claiming to have seen something, you're witnessing something that didn't happen. That's what a false witness is. You're saying, yeah, yeah, that happened. Uh, no, it didn't. You're lying about it. It's just, I mean, bearing false witness is another, word, another term for lying. It was so important to God, he, he etched it in stone in the Ten Commandments. And it's so important, he says, anybody that even makes one lie, not getting in the kingdom of heaven. And that's reiterated Revelation 22 also. It says, um, talking about without, without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. So even just making one lie is enough. And that's why, like, I, it doesn't happen very often without soul winning. Just remember verse 27 here in chapter 21. If you show them verse 8, and they say, well, yeah, but I think that's, you know, I don't really, you know, I'm not like a habitual liar. It's not like I'm lying all the time. Of course, I've lied in my past, but you could show them, well, have you made a lie? Because people want to justify and say, well, it's not like I'm just always a liar. Thinking that, oh, well, then that's okay. God will accept you into his kingdom because you, you don't really lie that much. When even making a lie is enough to say, nope, not righteous, not good enough. Flip back, if you would, to Proverbs. We're done in Revelation. And we're going to look at Proverbs chapter 25. See, not only is a lie bad enough to send you to hell, it's one of the Ten Commandments, but when you speak lies, you are actually harming others. You are doing harm to other people. You say, well, how is that possible? Well, I'm just, it's just words. I'm just saying things. It does harm to other people. Look at Proverbs 25, verse 18. The Bible reads, A man that beareth false witness against his neighbor is a maul and a sword and a sharp arrow. Those are all weapons, right? If you don't know what a maul is, it's like a club and a, and a sword and a sharp arrow. These are all designed to hurt, to injure, to destroy. And if you're bearing false witness against your neighbor, you're lying about people, you are actually causing harm to them. You're causing harm either to their name, to their reputation, to something about them, or you might be causing them harm, especially if it's someone being under scrutiny by the law. And you lie about that person. You know, you, you swear to tell the truth and then you lie about them just to get them in trouble. And we're going to get into the punishment about that. But turn, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter 9. You're in Proverbs. So just flip over a few more uh, pages to the right. We're going to go to Jeremiah chapter 9. We're going to see a little bit how wicked people use lies as a way to hurt others. In Jeremiah chapter 9. We're starting off with the, with the worst of the worst as far as the lying goes. We're kind of starting with, with just real bad that hopefully I wouldn't think that anybody in this room is like guilty of having these types of lies. But we're going to, don't worry, we're going to end off with lies that are a lot easier for people to commit. However, they're still lies. And they still fall under the same condemnation of Revelation 21.8 because it says all liars, not just the really bad ones. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse number 1, the Bible reads, 
Oh, that my head were waters and mine eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Oh, that I had in the wilderness a lodging place of wayfaring men, that I might leave my people and go from them. For they be all adulterers, an assembly of treacherous men. Look at verse 3. And they bend their tongues like their bow for lies. But they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth. For they proceed from evil to evil, and they know not me, saith the Lord. So God here is describing this wicked people that are, it says they bend their tongues like a bow, ready to shoot at people and to shoot out that arrow of a lie to pierce somebody through with him. That's, and that's, that's the, the imagery that's being given there about telling a lie to destroy someone. Let's keep reading here. Verse number four. Take ye heed every one of his neighbor, and trust ye not in any brother. For every brother will utterly supplant, and every neighbor will walk with slanders. And slanders is just another name for lies. You're speaking falsely about somebody. You're saying, don't trust your neighbor. Don't trust anyone. And you know what? Honestly, this is good advice. The Bible says, Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. Now, there is a certain level of trust that I give people that I think is healthy to be able to give people, a certain level. But there's also a certain level that I think you shouldn't be giving to people. And, for example, your most valuable things. Like for me, one of my most valuable things is my wife and children. Right? And especially my children who are not able to really defend themselves or take care of themselves. They need to be watched over. And we're living in a much more wicked society as it is with all kinds of horrible things happening to children. Hey, I'm not going to trust anyone. There's liars all over the place. There's people who will lie and deceive. And they, they get their lie ready like a bow and say, oh, yeah, I love kids. I, you know, I'll help them out, I'll, you know, whatever. And then they go and defile them. And they, and they lie straight to your face. And they'll, they'll get you convinced, oh, yeah, what a wonderful person. And you go to church and everything else, right? Don't trust them. We, all, we, we only did, and God never says to trust in man. You will not find that anywhere in the Bible. He says, trust in the Lord. He said, when all men forsake you, God won't forsake you. He's right there with you. I mean, Jesus Christ had some, he surrounded himself with some great men, some great guys, but what happened? They did all forsake him. When he was with they, he was, he was left completely alone. And they were great guys. But you can't keep your trust in man. It has to be in God. Let's keep reading here. Verse number five. And they will deceive everyone his neighbor. Again, it's talking about lying. It's talking about slandering, deceiving, being deceptive, tricking them, and will not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies and weary themselves to commit iniquity. I've known people like this where it's basically they tell themselves a, a same lie over and over again to get, so that they can believe it, so that they actually can make themselves think that what they're telling you is true. They've taught their tongue to speak lies. And the really good liars, the people who are really good at it and real convincing, they'll be able to tell you straight in the face without batting an eye and be lying to you. And you have to watch out for these people. They're out there. Verse number six, thine habitation is in the midst of deceit. He's saying you live in the middle of deceit. Through deceit they refuse to know me, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will melt them and try them, for how shall I do for the daughter of my people? Their tongue is as an arrow shot out. Again, the same imagery. It speaketh deceit. One speaketh peaceably to his neighbor with his mouth, but in heart he layeth his weight. So again, that's where he's describing how the, the tongue is being used as an arrow, as a weapon, where with his words... Yeah, he speaks real peaceably, real nice, gain your confidence. Oh, man, everything's great. But in his heart, he's just trying to set that trap. He's saying, where can I lay that trap? I got this guy. And, then, you know, the best con men are the ones where they can gain your confidence and gain your trust. You see people, you know, especially old people will get, you know, they get these phone calls or they get letters and they get this stuff. And the way they get deceived, and even people nowadays with online, especially get emails, right? They'll send you an email now, the ones that you get from, from Africa, from Nigeria, and it just says, I want to send you $25 million, just, you know, call me and give me a credit, you know, you just have to pay this fee. That's an easy sign of a scam. That, that doesn't take much discernment, right? But the people who are actually really good at the lying are the ones that are going to 
copy and mimic the website or the, you know, the eBay or the Amazon or whatever and try to gain your confidence by something that you know and trust. You say, oh yeah, I've done business on eBay before. I've done business on Amazon. Those are, those are well reputable companies and I've bought plenty of times before and then they come in with this, with this facade of being from that company. And they do that on the phone. They do it with all kinds of things, trying to claim their being from some place because they want to gain your confidence. So they start by speaking peaceably. But in their heart, they're laying a weight. They're trying to, to, to set the trap for you to give them your money. Verse number nine, shall I not visit them for these things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? People don't bat an eye about lying many times. And we need to be vigilant just to be on the lookout for and just always be aware of it. Now, you don't always just have to assume that everybody's always lying to you, right? That's, a, that's not necessarily how you protect yourself. But when it comes to, to things that are valuable to you, again, it goes back to that trust level. There's a, I, I value my money to an extent, right? I don't want to just be taken by fraud and when I work real hard to support my family just to give it over to some thief that's lying to me because I need that money to go to my family. It's not that I love money, but the money does have value. It's, it's what is exchanged for my time and my work and my job. That's valuable to me. Taking care of my family is valuable. So again, with, with that, with those things in mind, the level of trust that you have for people shouldn't be that high. I mean, it's, uh, it's one of those things in order to protect yourself from those that have a lying tongue and that will be willing to say anything just to get you to, um, to open up to them. Now, within the church, obviously I have friends. There's people I'll lend things to, I'll lend money to and everything else. And I don't think that they're going to do anything wrong or harm me or whatever. But you know what? Within church, if I do lend anything out, I just plan on not getting it back just because I don't want to have then a, a, a strife within somebody, you know, with someone that, from the church. Keep that in mind. I mean, sometimes people lie even unintentionally. Now, here we just read about wicked people who are setting a trap and they're, they're explicitly trying to deceive somebody. But there are many lies that people tell that are unintentional. For example, when you say you're going to go do something, oh yeah, out here, I just need to borrow this for a week and I'll get it right back to you. Right? How often have you said that to someone? Now, completely well-intentioned, you probably mean very well of saying this is your plan and your intention of doing it. But then you just don't do it. Or you break it and you can't return it to them, whatever. You know, there's so many things that can happen. You know, we just want to be careful also for the things that we say. But I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. That's kind of more near the end of the sermon. I'll go through a lot more examples similar to that. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy 19. Because here we've seen, we've already seen examples of people who are using lies and using their words to do evil unto others, to hurt other people, to trap them. Deuteronomy 19 deals with the punishment for the false witness, for someone who lies about someone else. And we're, again, we're going to see an example of how serious this sin is and, and how it's treated. So if you tell a lie about someone else, how does God treat that in the law? Deuteronomy 19 explains. Look at verse number 15 of Deuteronomy 19. The Bible reads, One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin and any sin that he sinneth. At the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. So God sets the ground rules here because he's giving them the law and he's saying, okay, if someone does this, here's the punishment. If someone does this, here's the punishment. And he's saying, well, you need to have witnesses. People need to see the, you can't just accuse people of a crime and not really know that they did it. You can't just say, well, I know that this person must have done it because they hate me. But you didn't and there's nobody that saw it, no witnesses, no evidence that shows that this person did that. You can't just make those accusations against people because those accusations stick. When someone hears you make a claim or an accusation against somebody, it's, it's what happens all the time. Like, um, obviously, like pedophilia is, is a horrible, disgusting, you know, perverted. People hate pedophiles. They get, that's why they get they're killed in prison so often because normal people just think that's disgusting and they just need to be put to death, which I agree with, they do. But if someone were to accuse you of something like that with zero evidence, guess what everyone's going to think about you? 
Even if you're exonerated, you're cleared, no evidence tied, everyone's going to be thinking, wow, that guy's a pedophile. As soon as the accusation comes up, it does damage. It damages you. It's going to damage you to have, you know, then any type of influence with people, friendships, business, all kinds of things can happen as a result of a false witness that's, that's taken against somebody. And because of that, look at what God said here. He says, first of all, you have to have, well, you can't convict anyone of a crime unless you have witnesses. You said you need at least two or three. Because it can't just be one. You can't just have one person because what about the liar? Right? Someone who's just straight faced with this lie, yep, this person did it. It happens. He says, you need multiple witnesses to, to establish this matter. But knowing that there still are false witnesses, there are still are people that are willing to lie, even two or three, here's what he says for when you find out about that. Verse 16, if a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges which shall be in those days. And the judges shall make diligent inquisition and behold, if the witness be a false witness and hath testified falsely against his brother, then shall ye do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother. So shalt thou put the evil away from among you. And those which remain shall hear and fear and shall henceforth commit no more any such evil among you. And thine eye shall not pity, but life shall go for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, for foot for foot. So what he's saying is, let's say, for example, someone accused another person of murder. Murder in the Bible carried the death sentence. So if someone says, you know, someone really doesn't like someone else and they're willing to lie because, you know what, I know if he gets convicted of murder, he's being put to death, end of my problems. And they lie about that person. And then, and then it comes up that, hey, this guy's lying. There's judges that will make inquisitions, diligent inquisitions. They're going to look into the matter. They're going to seek it out. They're going to ask questions and do all their due diligence to find out the actual truth of the matter. Is this person lying or not? If they find out he's lying and say, you know what the, the, crime, the punishment is for that? Now you're getting put to death. Because you were going to have this person put to death. Guess what? That has come back upon your own head now. And all for what? For words. For words. Because it's so damaging. Because the words that he spake, the lies, the false witness that he's bearing is enough to ruin and take that other person's life. It's an act of aggression against that other person because of what the punishment is. And regardless of the punishment, he says, whether it's death, you know, life's going to go for life. If it's, a, you know, any, whatever the punishment is, if it's financial, then it, that's what you're going to pay. Doesn't matter what it is, you are going to pay the exact same reward. And what I like about this is that God says, hey, the people that hear, they're going to fear. They're going to they're rise. When, when the false witness gets put to death, people are going to look at that and be like, yeah, maybe I'll think twice before bearing a false witness before I open up my mouth and lie. Because I really don't want that happening to me. Now, that's the extra deterrent that goes along with God's uh, punishments. And I preached already to God of Justice last week and, and how... God's ways are so much better than our ways, and He has so much more wisdom than we have. And people these days want to feel like they're so much more morally superior to God and that they're so much more loving than God and we should just extend all this mercy to criminals when God didn't Himself and He had very good reason not to because that people are going to hear and they're going to fear and it's a major deterrent when you have these types of appropriate punishments on the crimes. When people have to see these days, it's like there practically isn't a death penalty. Right. It's not enforced. I mean, it may still be on the books in some cases, but these people are living 20, 30, 40, 50 years, 60 years dying in prison instead of being executed. There's no fear anymore. No one's going to care. They're like, well, what's the worst that's going to happen? I'll be put in prison. I'll get three squares a day, be able to work out or whatever. Instead of fearing, no, I actually might get judged here and just lose my life and just lose everything. But that's, that's where you get when man thinks they know better and when they're just so much more compassionate and loving than God is. I, I don't understand how people have the gall to compare themselves to God and think that they just know better. It's ridiculous. But um, you're still in Deuteronomy 19? Turn, if you would, to um, Ezekiel 13. We already saw in Proverbs, God hates a lying tongue. 
And that's what we're preaching on. God hates it. It's abomination to him. We've seen the people who bear false witness and, the, and their, their intent is just to lay a trap, is to hurt other people. And we saw the punishment for that. But what about the false prophets? I think there's a special hatred in God's heart for the false prophets. I'm going to read for you from Jeremiah 23. You're turning to Ezekiel 13. Jeremiah 23, verse 31 reads, Behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, He saith. So all these prophets say, well, God says this and God says that. But God didn't really say it. He said, those are the false prophets. Verse 32 of that chapter says, Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them and cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore, they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. So God's saying, I'm against those, those prophets. I'm against those people that are saying, God says this and God says that. And he says, they cause my people, to, they cause people who are saved to err, to be in error. He said, these false prophets, you got to be aware of the false prophet because they will cause you as a Christian to err from the truth, to be in error through their lying divinations and their, and their tongues when they, when they say that God says something and he didn't really say it. Now, the way that you protect yourself from that is by getting in the Bible and, and reading it for yourself and looking everything up and being diligent about it. Unfortunately, most people won't do it because it's work. Most people just like to receive, oh, pastor said this. It must be true. Well, he used the Bible and they just accept what's being said instead of actually looking it up. Because the pastor is going to say, well, God says in the Bible that, and just preach out of their own heart. It sounds it sound really good, and it might convince some people, but it's going to cause you, those lies will cause you, as a saved person, to uh, err. But we're in Ezekiel 13. We're going to see some more examples here of the false prophet. Ezekiel 13, verse number 17. But reads, Likewise, thou son of man, set thy face against the daughters of thy people, which prophesy out of their own heart and prophesy thou against them. So he's telling you, look, these people that prophesy out of their own heart, they're just preaching whatever it is that comes into their heart. You need to prophesy against, you need to preach against them. Jump down to verse 19. It says, And will ye pollute me among my people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread to slay the souls that should not die? And to save the souls alive that should not live by your lying to my people that hear your lies. And then skip down to verse number 22. Because with lies ye have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad, and strengthened the hands of the wicked that he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. The false prophets that speak lies. Basically what they're doing here is calling evil good and good evil. These are the guys that are not willing to condemn the wicked. They're not willing to call out the sin. And instead, they'll, they'll call out the righteous. He says, to slay the souls that should not die, back in verse 19, Killing people that don't deserve death, right? You're, you're passing a judgment on them. They're not the ones that deserve it and to save the souls alive that should not live. You know, the, the, the reprobates, the homos that are out there that deserve the death penalty, you're saying, oh, no, they should live. But, you know, the, the hate-speaking, you know, pastor that, that's saying that they should die, well, they're the ones that should be put to death. That's the false prophet. And that's the type of approach that they take. And it says he strengthened the hands of the wicked. And I think there's many false prophets out there today that are strengthening the hands of the wicked. They're making them bold to do even more wickedness because they're not railing against and preaching against their sin like they ought to. The, the Sodomites are getting really bold because who's coming out against them? Nobody. I saw just recently, I mean, another false prophet, uh, John Piper, right? I guess, and, and I forget what state he's in, somewhere like in the Midwest, in the North, like, like Michigan or, or Wisconsin or some, somewhere over there. I, I don't remember exactly where he's at. But um, I just read this article how he's 
their church like isn't making any stand and they're, and they're trying to pass some bill or some proposition with all this homo stuff and the bathrooms I think it is but it's something along those lines and like he's not even coming out and like telling people that yeah we need to like stop this right. not and you know what he's doing he's strengthening the hands of the wicked right. by not coming out against the wickedness because I mean that guy's not preaching you know it's, it's one thing because uh, you know I, I kind of balk a little bit at the whole like the government getting involved and making all these rules and stuff because I don't think that that's the answer either because the real answer isn't about the bathrooms it's about the death penalty it's about what the real crime is I mean the sodomites need to be put to death according to the Bible. That's what's scriptural. So if he was up there, and if he doesn't make any mention about some stupid amendment in, the, in that state's constitution about bathrooms or what, whatever the deal is, I don't care about that so much as if he's still just, just preaching hard on, against the extreme wickedness and the root of the problem anyways. I mean, if you're doing that job, you're doing the job. But he's not doing that because he's a false prophet. And he strengthens the hands of the wicked. Now, when we look at, at lies, of course, a lie is only a lie because it's not the truth, right? So you can't have lies without the truth. In order to have the truth, in order to have a lie, it's, it's, it's speaking something that is not true. John 17, 7. Turn, if you would, to, um, turn if you would to 1 John chapter 2. Les, can you take care of that, please? John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Of course, God's words are the words of truth. We're going to look at some other lies today. You have the lies of the false prophets. You have the lies of the wicked that is trying to bear false witness and get people in trouble. You also have lies that are disguised as truth where they might even say Holy Bible on the cover. Right? Right? There are plenty of lies, textbooks, books full of lies that claim to be something that they're not. The Holy Bible is a collection of God's words that is holy, that's set apart, that's sanctified, that is pure. As I read, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. God's word is truth. If you are going to claim that a book is God's word, it has to be the truth. In order to be the truth, there can't be any errors. There can't be any lies in it. There can't be any contradictions within the pages. Because as soon as you have the contradictions, well, that's not truth. Truth is without contradiction. Truth is without error. Truth is perfect. Truth is right. God doesn't make mistakes. And if there are errors in a book, it is not God's word. And if you're claiming that it is God's word, you're a liar. An easy example is if one book says that we are being saved and then another book, they both claim to be the Holy Bible. One says we are being saved and the other one says we are saved. They're not exactly the same thing. You say, oh, but it's real simil similar. Yeah, it's similar, but it's not the same. What is it that God said? Did God say we're being saved or did God say we are saved? Which ones are God's words? They can't both be. Either neither of them are or one of them is, but it's impossible for both of, both of the, the phrases to be God's words. What did he actually say? If, someone, if you were to quote me tonight in anything that I'm preaching, if you say, Pastor Burson said this, if you don't quote me word for word, then you're lying. Even if you get the, the point across, a general summary of what I'm saying, if you're saying, Pastor Burson said thus and so, whatever it is, and I didn't actually say that, it's a lie, because I didn't say it. If you're quoting someone and we're quoting God's words for us, they need to be right, and if they're not, then it's a lie. The Bible says in 1 John 2.21, I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Lies don't come out of the truth. You, you don't, if, you have, if you have God's word, you have the truth, you don't have any lies. You cannot have lies. So if you're going to say, I, I have the truth in my hand today in the Holy Bible, there better not be any lies in there. Because otherwise you don't have the truth. Yeah. 
Now, just as much as God hates the false prophets because they claimed that God said things they didn't actually say, because that was what he hated about them. He's saying, you know, they're saying God said this and I didn't say it. It's the exact same thing with, with those that have corrupted his words through the Bibles. Now, where did I have you turn? Revelation 22? Or is it... Where, I forget where I had you turn. Do you remember? Uh, 1 John 2. Well, I quoted from that one. I said earlier where to go to. Oh, that was long. Okay. Turn, if you would, to Revelation 22. <laughs> Let's make it easy. In Proverbs 30, verse 6, the Bible says, Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. So if you add unto God's word, if you say a thing, because God didn't say all those things, and you start adding to his words... He's saying you're a liar. God's going to say that you're wrong. He's going to reprove you and you're going to be found a liar. Uh, that's something that the, the Mormons ought to remember these days when they think that they have these extra revelations from God through Joseph Smith and their Book of Mormon. Don't add unto God's word. Don't say, thus saith the Lord, when he didn't say it. Lest God repro reprove thee and, and thou be found a liar. But in Revelation 22, we see the very serious, serious punishment of someone who actually corrupts God's words. And this is, I mean, again, let's get a good idea of how God feels about lying. We already saw it deserves hell. We saw that the false witness will bear the same exact punishment that, that the person that he was trying to bear false witness against would have received. But here, when it's talking about God's word, because God's word is holy. You don't mess with God's word. You don't say that God said something they didn't say. And it drives me nuts when I hear all these people, all these preachers that say, I got this word from the Lord. Yeah. Really? Did he speak to you? What kind of a voice did it sound like? What exactly did he say? Did he say something that contradicts what his word says in the Bible? Because if he did, you're a liar. And those guys are all a bunch of liars. Oh, I got this word from the Lord. Now, sometimes they're just referring to some feeling that they have. That's not a word from the Lord. That's just a feeling that you have. I'm not saying we can't be led by the Spirit because I believe that we can be. I believe we can be prompted. I believe that the, the Holy Ghost can bring to remembrance God's Word in our life. He uses us that way and He works within us that way. But don't lie and say, I got this Word from the Lord and it's just whatever it is that you think is right or good out of your own heart. Revelation 22, verse 18 says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And you look through the book of Revelation and the plagues that come down upon the earth, those are some pretty serious plagues. I don't think you want those upon you. Verse number 19, And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. That is salvation. The opportunity for salvation is gone. Those people that had put together and compiled the NIV the New Living Translation, the New King James, all these other false versions that claim to be the Holy Bible. Woe unto them, because Revelation 22 explains what happens to people like that. And I don't know if, you know, if those people are still around today or still alive. They have no hope of salvation. They are reprobate. They are rejected because they have taken away from God's Word and He has taken out their part of the book of life. No longer opportunity to believe and get saved. And that's a sad thing, but you know what? God takes His Word seriously. God's Word is powerful. God, God spake this world into existence. It's all from His Word. God expects us to believe His Word. In fact, that's what saves our soul, is believing God's Word. Amen. His Word is important. And He doesn't want anyone messing with it. Now, we ought to have that same type of an attitude about our own words. We ought to make sure that we are very careful with our own words and that we um, would not allow our words to be um, lied about, but also that we would make sure that what we're saying is true and right. Now, um, oh, one more point here. I, I have a few more, I have a few more uh, points I wanted to bring up about the people that lie and about the Bible versions. 
And, and I want to make this one real simple point. And from time to time I'll do this because we're a King James only Baptist church. We believe that this is the preserved word of God. That, that you know, because people will say, oh, well, if you have these problems and people are adding to it, then where is the word of God? Well, he has kept it for us. And it is found in the, in the authorized version of the Bible. But um, one of the arguments that people will say is that, uh, you know, the oldest manuscript is the best. And that's the, the way of thinking behind the new versions. They'll say, oh, well, if this is dated, you know, 300 AD as opposed to 400 AD, this must be more reliable and more accurate just, just by virtue of it being older. But that argument doesn't hold water. And biblically, I'm going to give you, turn if you would to 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. There have always been people that have been trying to corrupt God's word. They have always existed, going all the way back to the beginning in the Garden of Eden where Satan questioned God's word. Yea, hath God said. Did God really say that, Eve? Is that really what he said? You shall not surely die. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And ever since then, people have always been trying to corrupt God's words. So this idea of the oldest being the best is simply false. It does not hold water. The Apostle Paul even said himself that people were corrupting God's word in his day. Look at verse number 17 of 2 Corinthians chapter 2. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God speak we in Christ. He says, there's many people that are corrupting God's word. We're not like them because we're actually giving you God's real words. We're actually giving it to you. Here is the truth. Just like today, you have so many different religions, so many different beliefs, so many people believe in work salvation. They're lies. They're corrupting the truth. That's not right. But guess what? Here is the truth. The truth does exist. You know, a lot of people like to be just beaten down and worn down. Well, I can't believe anything because I don't know. I've got these guys lying to me over here. These guys lying to me. And that's Satan's plan. Is to get you so confused and so burnt out on it that you just feel like you can't believe anything. What is the truth? And Apostle Paul saying, look, no. Sincer sincerely, as of sincerity, as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. He said, we, we're giving you the truth here. But there are many. We're not like them, but there's many that are corrupting the Word of God. So with this in mind, with the Apostle Paul saying, we're not like many which corrupt the Word of God, what would happen if someone dug up some manuscript from the Apostle Paul's days? They found some manuscript. They, they, they was buried somewhere, was in some cave, whatever is preserved, and they find this great finding. And it dates all the way back to, to 60 AD or whatever, right? Whatever time frame. You're going to say it's really, really early. But what if it was a manuscript from one of the many that were corrupting the Word of God? Right. Because there were a lot of them out there. What if it was from the one of many? And you just, I mean, you don't know where it's from or who had it or, or who was using it. It's just dug up. I mean, it was in the ground. It was in a cave or whatever. You could try to guess whose it was, but you don't know for sure. Those people are long, long, long gone. But it's really old. Would that make it more reliable? Absolutely not. That's why the King James Version and, and the translators use the, what's called the received text. It's been received by believers, by people who, you know, th this is what, we, what throughout history has been accepted as the Bible, as Scripture, by people who actually believed in Christ. And um, that was the thinking. It was a majority text, and it's what was um, when you could, because there's letters and epistles and stuff going around between the different churches that the apostles knew were legitimate churches. You know, it's not like they were Catholic churches. It's not like they were other apostate churches. They were legitimate churches. They knew where they were going and they knew where they were being copied from and being spread out to all these other churches that the Apostle Paul started in all these various regions. So when you start comparing those manuscripts from all the different regions of these churches that you know were legitimate churches and what they were using because they were sharing it between each other, you know, the church at Thessalonica, the, Thurs the, the church at Ephesus, the church at Corinth, the church at Jerusalem, the church, you know, all these various churches that had all these epistles and were sharing all the epistles between themselves. 
you could compare the majority of the manuscripts from all those areas and find out what's right and if there's corruption because they were actually preaching the truth but there are many people and there always have been many people trying to corrupt and change God's words just as much as there's been many people trying to put Jesus Christ to death to silence his voice that way to speak falsely about him to lie about him there's getting false accusations brought against him in order to even put him to death because he didn't do anything worthy of death just as much as people hate him that much, people hate his words. People hate his father's words. And they will corrupt it. And they have been. You can't just rely on the date of a single manuscript to determine if it's correct or if it's not correct. Right. And I'll say this. These new versions are full of lies. Because they're not the truth. Because they're not from God. Because they claim to be from God and they're not. And they originated from the father of lies. John 8, 44 says, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Satan's a father of lies. He, is a first, he's, he started the lies, back, like I said, back in the Garden of Eden, lying about God's word. And he's spawned off all these new translations and these other perversions of God's word that have twisted God's word and changed them from the truth into a lie. And saying, thus saith the Lord when the Lord hath not said so. Now, closing up, if we're going to follow Christ's example, of course, he is the truth. He said, I am the truth, the way, the, the, way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He is the truth. Christ is the truth. We ought to be careful to keep our own words. And he kept his word in high regard. When Jesus says anything, you know that he means it. You know, one of the, one of the famous verses, and I, I go out soul winning, and I use John 5, 24 almost every single time. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And I'll ask people, well, can we believe? And I say, these are the words that Jesus himself spake. When he was on his earth, Jesus Christ himself in John 5, 24 said those words. Now, if Jesus makes a promise, he says, you have everlasting life. You believe you have it. You have everlasting life. He says, you shall not come into condemnation. Can we believe that? Can we take Jesus at his own words? Or was Jesus a liar? Was Jesus a deceiver? Of course we can. I mean, that's what I'm staking my soul on. Amen. Is that Jesus actually spake the truth. If Jesus was a liar, we have no hope <laughs> for anything. No hope. Jesus Christ spake the truth, and he was careful about his words. We ought to be careful about our words, too. We know his word to be true. Turn, if you would, to, uh, well, no, yeah, you don't have to turn anywhere. The last verse, we're not, we're not going to have you turn anywhere. Numbers 30, verse 2 says, If a man vow a vow unto the Lord, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word, he shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. This is a concept that seems to be going by the wayside these days of a man being a man of his word. You know, you think back to old timers when they would say, you know what, your word matters. If you're going to say something, you better follow through and do it. And you know what? That's a biblical concept to have. That's what we saw here in Numbers 30, verse 2. He's saying, look, if you're going to vow a vow, you keep your vow. Now, there's a story in the Old Testament, in the book of Judges, of this man named Jephthah. Jephthah prayed to God. He was, in, he was having this battle right against the enemy. And he says, God, you know, you help me out with this. You deliver. You give this great deliverance. Whatever meets me when I come home, I'm going to offer up as a sacrifice to you. And he made this vow. And it was a stupid vow. But it was a vow nonetheless. He made a promise unto God. Now, of course, God made the great deliverance. God gave him victory. Exactly what he asked for. So now he comes home. He knows he needs to keep this vow. But who meets him when he comes home? His daughter. See, when he made the vow, he wasn't thinking about his daughter. When he made the vow, he's thinking, you know, like, He's going to come across a, you know, a, a cow or a horse or what, whatever, right? Some animal. That's what was in his mind when he made the vow. But he said the words. He didn't say whatever animal. He didn't say whatever, you know, he didn't stipulate when he made the vow 
what it was going to be. And in that story, he ends up sacrificing his child because he kept his word, because he knew that he didn't want to break. That's how much he treated his word. Now, I think he, he, you know, he caused himself to be in a sinful situation no matter what he did. He, may, he painted himself into a corner and had no good way out. And, and see, oftentimes people look for counsel and advice on situations where they've gotten themselves in a situation and you don't have a good answer. There is no real good way to not sin in making a choice. But he happened to choose, I'm not going to break my vow unto God. Either way, he would have been sinful. Either way. Even, break, even keeping his vow, I think it's sinful for him to, to say, but it's also sinful for him not to keep his vow. So it was, you know, not a good situation to be in. But we need to keep that in mind when we open up our mouths. See, way too frequently people just open up their mouth and will speak things without thinking about them. And just say way too much. Now, our testimony is supposed to glorify God. Not only the way we live our life, but the things that you speak. Why would anyone want to believe you about the truth of salvation if you're known for lying? I mean, just think about that. You say, oh, no, no, really, believe me this time. You'd be like the boy that cries wolf, right? The story of, of the boy that just, he says this, it's not true, right? Oh, help me, help me, the sheep are coming, you know, the, the, the sheep are being devoured by wolves, and people come and help. And then it's like, people are going to stop listening to you. You lose credibility. And if you say things, and if you get a, a history and you get known for saying things and it doesn't come true, you have zero credibility. Now, think about this, parents, with your children. It's real easy to threaten your children with some form of punishment, right? If you don't follow through on that, they're going to learn that. They're going to learn. They don't really mean that. Oh, yeah, Dad said that before, but it didn't happen. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. You know, they're going to get used to that. First, one thing that's going to happen, they're going to lose their respect for you because why would they believe what you're starting to say? And now what you're doing is you're harming yourself because what if you want to tell them something really important? Now, that was just a, 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 you know, a punishment thing maybe, and maybe you're thinking like, oh, I'm being real merciful for them. But you're not following through on what you said you were going to do. You've opened up your mouth. You've lost credibility. But now you want to tell them something really You want to give them the gospel. You want them to get saved. You want to tell them some kind of truth. Your credibility has already been shot. You say all these things. Well, what about God? You know? And they see the analogy. Maybe even they come to church and they see the analogy of God being a father. Well, God said he's going to do these things, but is he really going to do them? Right? God said he's really angry about these things. Is he really going to be angry? Am I really going to get that much of a punishment? It's confusion to the child. Now, hopefully the child will realize that, you know what, maybe your dad's a liar, but God is not. And when God says something, it will come to pass. There is no doubt about it. You don't have to wonder, will God judge me? Yes, he will. Yes, he will. But parents, don't lose your credibility with your children by saying things and not following through. If you're going to say them, then do them. And I understand the reason why people say them oftentimes, and, and look, I get this as a parent, because you don't want to get up and just give them the proper discipline right away, you're going to threaten them with something else, right? Or you're just going to threaten them, well, I'm going to spank you, I'm going to spank you, you know, like, look, if you say, do that again and I'll spank you, don't just come back and say, and they do it, well, now I really mean it if you do that again. Look, when you say something, do it. Because when you don't follow through, you're not keeping a vow. You're not keeping something that you said you're going to do. You're lying. You become a liar. That's one easy way for people to become a liar. Or think about this. Here's another easy way. And this is another uh, aspect when it comes to things that are spiritual. People who are real spiritual, right? How many times have you heard, oh, I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. I love when people say they're going to pray for me. I think it's great. I think we ought to pray for each other. But don't say you're going to pray for someone and then not do it. Amen. Don't go to someone and say, I just told someone today. I got their name. I wrote it down. I said, I'm going to pray for you and for your son. Woe unto me if I just don't pray for him now. After I opened up my mouth and made a promise and said, I'll pray for you. You ought to do it. 
Don't just throw words around flippantly. You know what? A lot of people like to say things like that because it sounds great and nobody knows whether or not you actually do it. You can get all this great, oh, how like, you know, and the lady was thankful when I said that. And I don't say things like that because I just want praise and I want to be thanked or I want them to think how nice of a person I am. I say it because I want them to be comforted and know, hey, I'm going to pray for you. But I'm actually going to do it. That's why I wrote down the names when I walked away from there and it's, it's on my card to remember, say, this is what I'm going to pray about tonight. But if I don't do it, I'm a liar. And we've already seen how God feels about liars. Be careful with the things that you say. This is, you know, what all it boils down to, I don't think any of you are in here that are wicked, trying to lie to people to, to, to gain their confidence and to do harm to them, right? That's the wicked people. But we all open up our mouths and we all say things. We don't want our words to become so just careless and, and tossed around that no one ever really knows for sure if you're telling the truth. We know how God feels about lying. We know that it, that it causes a, a, a soul to go to hell. That's how bad it is. God etched it in stone. And um, God still feels the same way. It's an abomination to him. It's abominable. Six things that the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination. Lying is mentioned twice. Let's be careful to make sure that we are saying accurate things and let's follow through. And you know what? Sometimes you, really, you say things and it gets you into all kinds of trouble and it's going to be really difficult to keep your word. The easy thing to do is just say, well, okay, they'll just have to deal with it. I broke a promise to them. The hard thing is going to do is going to be like, well, how can I still keep my word? We just dealt with this. And, you know, and here's the way that lies can be damaging. Just recently we had, and, and this is real minor, Right? This is on a real small scale. But I think people don't think about it and with these days. You know, we had a we had this little party for my daughter. Or she she had this party. She she wanted to have this big play date. And invited all these people, right? And it was gonna be a great time. And we had on there, please RSVP. We need to know who's gonna show up. Why? Because we're doing all kinds of work, we're cooking all kinds of food, we're trying to get everything prepared to have this great thing for these kids to be able to play. And people, yep, we're going to be there, yep, there's going to be me and, and this child and this child, and, this, and we're going to be there, 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 and they don't show up. One, that just shows a complete lack of respect and disregard for the person. But then how does that feel towards my daughter who's expecting to have all these people show up because they told them, they say, hey, I'm going to be there. And she's excited. She's waiting for him. And then, where are they? Right? right? Now, is it the end of the world? No. But were they thinking about the damage that they're doing or the, you know, the harm that they're kind of causing to her, to her feelings and, and just consideration even at all towards another person when you say you're going to do something and they're all excited about it and then you just don't do it? No. And, and again, that's a, that's a minor example. But there's so many things like that. People just kind of get this, you know, and they say, oh, well, I got busy. But you said you were going to do something. If you say you're going to do something, even if it's the smallest of things, you say, well, it's not that big of a deal. Well, keep your word. Because now, I mean, I don't know who these people were, and I don't have, like, anything specific against them, but if they were going to say something to me again, I'm not going to believe them. You know, people say, oh, I'm going to do, th I'll, I'll do this for you. Okay, yeah, I'll believe it when I see it. We ought not to have our, you know, out in the world, you're going to get that. And these aren't church people that we're inviting. I mean, it's just, just people out in the world, right? Just your average person. It's easy to expect that out in the world, but that ought not to be the way it is in the church. We ought to be people of our word. When you say something, do it. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. We thank you that we can completely 100% rely on your words, dear God, that we don't have to question them. We know that your words are true. We know that you are not a liar, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to, to use your example and help us to be able to speak words and, and keep what we say, dear Lord. And that if that means speaking less, then maybe that's what we need to do to be able to filter our mouths some more and have some discretion on the things that we say so that we're not just automatically offering up our services or offering up things to people that we really aren't going to follow through with, dear Lord. Help us to, to have respect unto others and respect unto our own words and especially respect unto your words, dear Lord that um, we would cherish them and cherish the truth and not allow them to be corrupted, dear God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.